Got one welcome, councillors, uh, to the um, and welcome staff and the gallery to the uh, November meeting of council. Um, interesting times again. Uh, COVID, we knew that at some stage we may not have been out of the woods, so already staff have been active in preparing and putting things in place. So uh, hopefully it's uh, not a second wave, but just a little blip. Um, Welcome to you, Kirsty. Kirsty's filling. Kirsty Hargy's filling in for uh, uh, Joe Thomas, and also, sadly, could be sad for us, but joy for you, Marissa. That this is your last council meeting. Marissa leaves us, you know, in a week or two's time. So uh, during this period, we've uh, really appreciated your contribution, your uh, pleasant smile, and your wonderful mannerism. So. Uh, um, I know <coughs> members, we all wish you well in your next venture, and Martin and I will just struggle through the <laughs> way that we do. Um, at the LGA conference, uh, or the AGM, we didn't have the conference of course, at the AGM Council was awarded a highly commended certificate for the rollout of our uh, green bin in the Go Green award from SA Health. Uh, consultation period has just completed so we'll have uh, information as to what that consultation and what the feedback has been and Gary will present that at the next workshop. So to Gary and all of your staff, congratulations uh, for that initiative and to you the elected members for supporting the rollout of uh, that uh, Green Bin program. I have an apology from Councillor David DeBreeze, uh, who was a little unwell, so he, in wisdom, he decided it was best to stay home. He's pretty certain it's not that other thing, so can someone move, yeah, I'll move, that move uh, Councillor Hearn and second and Councillor Johnston uh, that we accept uh, the apology of Councillor DeBreeze? All those in favour? Carried. Item 1.5, minutes of the previous meeting for confirmation, the council meeting held on the 20th of October 2020 at 9am. So I move those. Councillor Miller and seconded Councillor Johnston. All those in favour, those minutes be accepted. Carried. There's no matters arising from the minutes. On page six of your agenda, we have 1.7 is a petition for the uh, Kalimna Road request to provide stormwater drainage and foot bath. Yeah, I'll move that then. Move Councillor Hearn. Seconded Councillor Schilling. All those in favour? Carried. There's no deputations uh, on 1.8, so 1.9 is a notice of motion amendment to the council resolution, uh, resolution on the 2018 um, Nuripta pool. Uh, this was a uh, notice of motion put forward by uh, Angla, Councillor Angus. Would you like to move that motion? <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. I would. Um, with, with that, I'll just get a second. The first well, second, councillor, yeah. uh, councillor Wee Smith. I see your hand that was up. So move, councillor Angerson. Second, councillor <coughs> Wee Smith. Mayor, do you want me to read the motion? In its entirety? Yes, please. Yes. Yep. Uh, I move that council amend part two of the resolution two o one eight slash dash two two slash two four eight two. That council undertake further consultation on future aquatic needs in Europe 
as informed by further community engagement, noting that the work the new for War Memorial Swimming Pool <coughs> shall permanently close when costs outweigh the community benefits as determined by Council at a future time. At the time the pool is closed, the Council shall A, decommission the pool with an appropriate budget allocation, and B, convert the open space area to a public space, including community engagement on design options. And if I may make a short statement in support of that. Yes. Uh, this amendment uh, to the motion from the September 2020 meeting is for the purpose of including the current Yuri swimming pool complex in future decision making regarding the aquatic activities in Yuri. The wording of the original motion gives the impression of an asset on borrowed time. However, this council has spent significant amounts of time, money, and expertise addressing many of the shortcomings, actual and perceived, that have been brought to Council's attention over the past five years. To exclude the Newry Pool complex from future planning is, in my opinion, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We need all viable options put to the public. The fact that Newry Pool is in a floodplain is also mentioned, and this should be kept in perspective. Over 75 years, the pool has been flooded maybe four times, about once in 20 years. This is more uh, a nuisance than a public health or safety issue. If the consultation process eventually finds that a new complex in a new location is justified, my amendment will at least allow the Newry Pool Complex to remain operational until a new facility is built. These projects take years, not months. I urge all councillors to support this amendment. Thank you, councillor. <coughs> councillor Wee Smith, you wish to speak to the seconder? Thanks. Um, I won't go on too much longer. I echo all of Councillor Angus's sentiments and um, I do thank him for the work he's put into this amendment. Um, I know it's taken a bit of time and thought and I know the community is going to appreciate that as well. Um, to me, this is a common sense approach to this situation at the moment. We need to acknowledge that, you know, there are some issues at the New York Pool which need to be addressed, um, but there's no sense in making a decision to close it while it's still functional. Um, so I think it's really important that we make sure the community is involved throughout this process, and we'll get to that further on in the meeting today. But, yeah, thank you, Councillor Angus, for your work. Councillor Johnston. May I move that the question be put, please? Councillor Johnson has moved that the... Councillor Miller? Second that. Councillor Miller has second. So uh, moved by Councillor Johnston, second by Councillor Miller, that the motion be put. All of those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Members, well, I will now put the motion. All those in favour of the motion? Yep. All those in favour of the motion put by Councillor Johnston and seconded by Councillor Wee Smith. No. Councillor Angus. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Angus. And I'm looking at you too. <laughs> All those in favour of the motion. That is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> On page 22, this is the Mayor's report, and I must <coughs> apologise, my cutting and pasting wasn't all that good again, and you see right at the bottom of the page that I've asked uh, the Minute Secretary to delete the information regarding gar grassroots photo promotion minister, with the Minister Canole. That was an old one that just still stayed in my document. So uh, uh, that'll be a correction that we'll make because uh, that didn't happen. And, and I also think the top of the next page as well. Is there another one? If you look at the top of the next page, you're back to July, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> in his time machine. Okay, okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Right, we did meet in Williamstown Hall. <laughs> I did, yeah, I did meet in the Williamstown Hall. Yes, I did. <laughs> Thanks for that. We're going to tidy them up in future. So, with that, any questions from uh, the mayor's report? 
Councillor Barrett. I just had uh, one question, and that was about the uh, section of the BBRF Round 5 application. Uh, can you just enlighten us with some of your discussions you had in relation to that? Yes, that was a... Um, thank you, Councillor Barrett. That was a telephone hook-up with uh, um, CEO Joe Thomas, and I think there was somebody else there, uh, with... Um, <coughs> Section 51, you remember that's Colin Steele and his organisation who operates out of Canberra. And it was just give us a briefing and a, and a bit of an update of where the next round uh, is likely to head and what are the things that we needed to be aware of uh, going into the next round of application. So that was what that was about. Uh, and I guess we've got those grant um, details in a report coming up a little bit later on. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. CEO. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just to add to your response, we've actually only just learned in the last couple of days that BBRF is not likely to be released until the new financial year. Um, we still haven't even seen the, um, uh, the uh, guidelines at this stage, but they don't expect to be materially change, but there will be some, some change. It's a moving beast, and we just have to be prepared to move quickly. <coughs> Thank you. Would someone like to move the Mayor's report? Councillor Angus and seconded by Councillor Habe. All those in favour? Carried. As amended. As amended, yes. <laughs> <laughs> As tidied up. Um, the consensus agenda. Is there any items that anyone wish to move? <coughs> Councillor Wee Smith. Um, item 4.3.3.1 and item 4.3.3.2. And I'd like to request that we adjourn those matters until after the presentations from Theresa Ross. <coughs> Thank you. Can I get a move? Can, you're happy to move, move, I'll that? move, move yep. that? Yeah. And can someone second that those matters be adjourned, <coughs> Councillor Johnston, until we've heard from the uh, Theresa Barossa representatives today? All those in favour? Carried. Is there any other items? I'll move the consensus agenda then. Okay, move the consensus agenda. Seconder, Councillor Hearn. All those in favour? Carried. Next item uh, is the um, on page 36, 7.2.1.1, the appointment of the uh, Deputy Mayor. There is a recommendation there for uh, associated with the process. Someone like to move that recommendation one? Councillor Wee Smith and seconded Councillor Miller. All those in favour? Carried. Members, I'll now call for nominations for the Deputy Mayor. <coughs> Councillor Mayor, Hayden. I nominate Councillor Johnson for the Deputy Mayor. Nominated Councillor Johnson. Yes. I don't need a second, and I understand, so that's fine. Any further nominations? As there is no further nominations, I believe we will now proceed to... Recommendation three. Thank you. Subject to a declaration of interest. Subject to a declaration of interest. <laughs> proud. Thank you. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Johnson, are you happy to take that role? I would be proud to. Okay, thank you. thank you. Okay, there's a couple of items there, um, and that in, uh, relates to the, the role of Deputy Mayor, as well as the... Um, proxy as far as and representing at the local government association meeting. So would like someone like to move? Subject to the new deputy mayor has to declare an interest because he gets paid more. Oh and has to leave the meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you declared an interest, have you sir? I you did. Now. It's in <laughs> we'll get the paperwork to we'll get the paperwork. Okay. <coughs> would someone like to move 
yeah. Councillor Hearn and seconded Councillor Barrett that uh, Councillor Johnston is the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour? Those against? Carried. We can bring uh, Councillor Johnston back into the room. Thank you, Councillor Johnston, the Deputy Mayor, for 12 months. So thank you for putting your name or accepting that uh, nomination. Uh, to Councillor Boothby, my sincere thanks and appreciation for the level of support and uh, advice and discussions that we've had over the last 12 months. Greatly appreciated. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks very much. Pleasure. I had to call on you a few times, well, more than a few times. and. Uh, and I know you enjoyed walking down the Angerston Street for the Christmas parade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carla. You're welcome. Um, next item, councillors, is on page 140. Mayor. Yes? That's, do we need to delegate the Deputy Mayor as the your proxy at the LGA? That's what you just did. You didn't mention it in that. Okay. Yeah. No, that, it, that's, that's parts one and two of that motion yeah. have been done. <coughs> yep. That, yep. That puts me off the hook. I was technically your deputy. Yeah, okay, yes, that's right, you were. Yeah. yeah. So no. Yeah, no, you're off the hook now. And pay the Councillor. And thank you for being my constantly <laughs> unbeknownst. <laughs> Um, next item is on page 140, the Community Plan Advocacy Strategy. Is there any questions? There's no questions. Uh, someone likes to move the motion? Councillor Troop and seconded by Councillor Johnston. All those in favour? Carried. Good job. Yep, well done. It's fabulous. Next item is on page 238, the Tourism, tourism Barossa Agreement. Yeah, I believe I've conflict of interest as a board member. Yeah, I will defend the conflict and leave the chamber. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Boothby. Any questions that any members may have need clarification? Mm. Someone would like to move yeah. the Tourism Barossa Agreement? Councillor Hearn, seconded Councillor Miller. All those in favour? Carry. Page two, and bring Councillor Boothby back in, please. <coughs> Thank you. Page 256, the Enterprise Risk Management Framework Policy. This is to consider and approve the Enterprise uh, Risk Management Policy and Enterprise Risk Management Framework. Any questions you need clarification with respect to that document? That report? Someone like to move? Move Councillor Angus. Seconded Councillor Troop. <coughs> All those in favour? Carried. Just, you wish up just quickly. Um, given the nature of this document, are we going to get a little bit of training as a elected member body? It mentions training requirements, but I think it'd be wise if uh, we had a small session in the workshop on this. With regard to the the risk management, CEO, sure can. Um, Maybe the new year, December is already full. Yeah, but particularly around risk appetite. Thank you. 
Next item is uh, 285, is the correction to the September 2020 minutes, 7.2.1.5. Any further clarification needed? So we'd like to move that correction. Councillor Angus and seconded Councillor Barrett. All those in favour? Carried. On page 288 is the annual report. Very comprehensive document. Any questions? Count. CEO and then Councillor Schilling. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Just um, Councillor Schilling has let us know the Accelerate Program for Women was actually, actually cancelled. Um, and there was one addition to the acknowledgement of country that needed to be made, but they can both be done in terms of the delegations you've given them to do non material changes. Councillor Schilling was due do you wish to ask questions? Yes, it's on a different matter, Mayor. Um, with the building and planning consent data, I was just interested to know why that information wasn't available. So that, uh, through you, Mr Mayor. So that is the ongoing issue we have with that particular data. So we're working on a revised, um, a new specification to accurately measure Time frames within the development system <coughs> that trigger or not trigger the start and the stop process. It's a little bit complex. We are working on it and it relates to the prior conversation the council had at the council meeting and workshop. And there's a report coming back hopefully that is ending tonight. Thank you. Any further questions? All those in favour of the recommendation as put, it's carried. Yep. Didn't move, oh, move, didn't I have a mover and a second? Oh, I'll move that way. No, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Angus seconded Councillor Johnston. Now, all those in favour? <laughs> Carry. <coughs> Page 532 is the uh, forward grant program. 532. <laughs> Questions on the forward grant program. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just a reminder, councillors, I updated the table and That's circulated right. that last week that has been posted online. Yep. It was simply to identify that some of the priorities within the local roads and community infrastructure program that we haven't seen the new extension may not meet that particular, well, that project may not meet that particular grant program. We think it will if it's reasonably consistent with the current program. Oh, we are hedging our bets and they're also adding in the state sport and rep fund for that particular project. Councillor Wee Smith, question or are question? you moving? I have a question um, and I may have missed this because I missed the last workshop. Um, but just in regards to the Culture Hub or the Creative Industry Centre, I'm just wondering why it's being recommended to put up the BBRF for a fifth time when we've obviously not been successful. It's recommended because it's consistent with the previous recommendations of the council. Okay. Have we had any feedback as to why we haven't been successful, or what we can do, or perhaps other programs we can target that towards? Uh, yeah, we've provided through you, Mr. Mayor, previous feedback that the application is extremely strong yeah. and has not been approved at the final stage. Politics. Well, We're still being encouraged to pursue it, and it's a. Still, a, it's an active decision of council to keep going. I guess I'm a bit perplexed with that because I think we've got some other projects there that perhaps we could be successful with. Um, and obviously, the CEO's flag that this round's being put back now, so maybe we should reconsider what we put forward to that program. I guess we're debating now, so Sorry, yeah. uh, <laughs> I believe the question's been answered. So, um, so I'd like to move the program as written. Councillor Boothby, seconder. Councillor Johnston, would you like to speak to the recommendation? Yes, yeah, so I think it's further to, to Councillor Wee Smith's questions. The, the feedback, as I, as I understand it, as the CEO said, is that the application is extremely strong. The federal government has actually funded similar projects for similar amounts of money. 
So I guess the question would actually go back to the government and our local member in terms of, um, you know, what level of engagement have we not done that we could do to communicate successfully uh, the merits of that <coughs> project? And I guess where we have had conversations inside this chamber before where, you know, if it is that, that our lack of unity on this is causing a problem, then I guess we do need to have, you know, what are the conversations we need to have within, you know, this room to solve those problems, so get everyone on the same page so that we can move forward. So if the feedback is that the there's some kind of local view that we are not all on board, then hopefully, for example, this today, this conversation today, and actually moving this resolution forward, if, it's, if it is supported, can start to answer that. Because it is, you know, it is a great project. It does deliver on the previous BDRF guidelines. We haven't seen the ones that, as they are revised for this round. Um, and this is the best shot for that project to get up based on the fact that the federal government has funded similar projects. So I would urge everyone to support it. Councillor Johnston. Just the second to one. That's just the second to one to speak. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to uh, thank. You were the seconder. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to thank Ms. Stutzi for um, alerting us to the fact that the Brendan Langbine Theatre is not that accessible. So this thing, as a concert venue, is really important. So I think I urge everyone to support it. Being on the board of a large school, I know that there are a whole range of issues about child safety and access that can occur when you have a facility inside of school grounds. So I think it's important to recognise that, that for the moment the, the Ross of Acts are really substantial um, purpose to concert venue. So I think that's really important to get in behind this uh, along with all the other benefits that are, that are likely to flow from the development of the Creative Industry Centre. Thank you. And I might further add that with, with my meeting with the Premier, he strongly su supported this and and I think there's, there's a lot of evidence out there Australia-wide how important these sorts of facilities are and how regions are just booming as a result of bringing this sort of uh, initiative into your region. Uh, any further comments? Councillor Lee Smith. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak against this motion for yes. the reasons I've already um, semi-outlined. I don't understand why we are putting forward a project that's been put forward to the same project already four times and knocked back. I acknowledge that it is a good project um, and it is a competitive um, round of funding, but I think we've got some other projects here and from conversations I've had with our federal member and also with the community, um, I think we've got some other projects here that could actually be successful in that program, like the um, soccer fields out at New York, which you know, it's something that that club has been crying out for years. It's such a huge sport in this region, um, and I think we do need to support that. I, I still, I'm not speaking against the project itself, and I think that seems to be getting miscommunicated in some places, but I don't feel it's necessarily hitting the brief. I know there's a lot of internal support for this project, but conversations I've had with local artists is that it's not exactly what they're wanting for. So, um, you know, th there's been conversation about the divisions in this chamber, around that project, but I think the divisions in this chamber are reflected with the divisions in the community. So, yeah, I'll be voting against this. Anyone wish to speak for the motion? Councillor Havick. I agree with uh, Councillor Wee Smith. Um, I think there's programs there that should be in front of the hub at this stage. And I agree with the... Uh, the, the, uh, the soccer pitch. There are so many young people involved with soccer. In fact, mm. uh, soccer junior people outweigh any other sport in the, in the total area. And that's the number of people that we are not cutting for at this time. I'm not knocking the, the hub, I'm into arts and crafts myself. But I do think that we've got it around the wrong way to a degree. That's all I've got to say. CEO and then Council Truth. Thanks, Mr Mayor. BBRF, uh, we don't know the final uh, construction of the guidelines, but it's normally built on significant economic development grounds. We, we don't know if the supporting component, and there were some supporting components in BBRF 4, supported, um, would meet that condition. Um, 
hence why we recommended that there was also a quicker way to support that particular project because the LRCIP and the State Support Program are going to be much ahead of BBRF5. In fact, the State Sporting Program have already put the EOI in because they already know the programs because we've been liaising with them for some years. Um, I'd just like to um, support the motion because I really would like to advocate for people who are not sporty people. Uh, I think there is a whole um, plethora of artists um, and, and um, people who are musically orientated, the radio, um, all sorts of things like that that I think need to be represented and to me it's very um, sport orientated so I don't have any problem with balancing it out with a culture hub because I think that there are people that we don't hear from um, who are not in a sport world that need um, this sort of support. So I'll be, I'll be fighting for this. Councillor Angus. Thanks, Mayor. I would also support the motion. I think this is a case of you must try and try again. If at first you don't succeed, keep on trying. And I acknowledge the staff's um, expertise in um, disseminating what projects are suitable for what uh, funding. And I think this one is uh, a funding bucket that is aimed at employment, which, which is quite appropriate for the Arts and Culture Hub project. So um, I know it's been up four or five times. I don't disagree with anything you say, uh, Councillor Wee Smith, but uh, I think we have to persist um, and eventually um, we, we may be lucky. I think it is the most appropriate uh, avenue to get some funding at this stage. So I urge you to support the motion. Question? Yep. May I ask a question to Ms Hargy? Yes. Um, is, I've heard that there's some changes to the original plan of the Culture Hub or Creative Industries Centre. Is there um, some new plans being drawn up or could you let us know, please? Yes. Um, no changes at this stage. We've had a, a meeting just to get our heads around the table in terms of what we could be pitching if we did go for another grant round. But as we don't know what is coming forward for the BBRF, we don't know what we don't know at So the there's moment. nothing available at the present time? No. Thank you. Any further comments? I'll allow you to close in a moment. I, I, I just would like to sort of add my two bobs worth and uh, highlight the fact there's been an enormous amount of work put in by staff and lots of consultation and uh, and with with focused on the soccer and I think the CEO has already identified that there is grant opportunities there. It would be a shame to throw the baby out with the bathwater when we've got this far in our uh, journey um, <clears throat> and knowing full well of uh, what support there is out there. Uh, I know that certain sectors may have different views, but it uh, depends on what circles you're moving. I'll allow you to close the debate. Councillor Boothby. Thank you, Mayor. And I, so it's, it's it, basically to summarise what, what you just said and what's been said as well, this is not an, a one or the other. As you can see, soccer is the first one on the list and we, we, are, we are going to be pursuing grant funds for that. This is not a one or the other conversation. This is a both. Um, and this is representing, you know, as Councillor Troop said, a whole bunch of people that we just don't hear from. COVID's shown us how important, you know, in terms of mental health, um, arts and health, there's a, they're, you know, creating new jobs. The opportunity that will come from that piece of infrastructure and development is absolutely massive. And I guess that's the challenge for officers now to retell that story in a way that will actually resonate with the decision makers because um, clearly it hasn't hasn't so far, and that's what we need to do. But we don't stop fighting the fight because we need to have that as a community, and we need to keep fighting for it. The festival of local government, where there's a, a gap in the market, there. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried.
Members, it's come to the time where um, we have a special <coughs> recognition for some valued, very valuable members of our community. And so, with that in mind, I've seen a gentleman I've known for a long time wander in, but I can't see him now. Where are you, Rex? You're hiding. <laughs> Come on down. Now, what, what I might ask, rather than record each one, we'll wait until I've got them all down here and we'll keep our 1.5 distance, Rex. Go, I know you want to hug me. No, no, I I <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> members, Rex Arnold, as I said, I've known Rex for a number of years and uh, Rex has volunteered for 10 years before retiring. Um, he has always been a very, very friendly person and the word I'm getting about you, Rex, that you're a favourite amongst the passengers. Well, you take some lollies or something wrong with you, didn't you? You no, sweeten no, them no. up, do you? No, no, no. Rex was a regular driver um, for us in the count for the council and the volunteer uh, transport. Uh, at least once a week, you've contributed 1,600 hours and more than 56 kilometres over the period. So. I'm going to change my mind. We will applaud as we go along. <laughs> well done, Rex. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Now, do I go back and stand up here? Oh, well, you, no, you can go back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I change things as I go along. You know that. Um, Liz Austin. Liz, come forward. Well, you're fairly impressive too, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, well done. Liz started volunteering back in 2008. Can you remember the first day? Oh, yes, I can actually. What was the highlight? What was the first trip? It was on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> on the bus. Okay. Taking the money. <laughs> Taking the money. People, yes. Well done, well done. We, we love when people take money, so that's great. <laughs> Liz was a regular driver who often drove more than once a week and would assist at the last minute on different trips. You would just jump in and take on the, the role. Liz was always smiling and friendly, and from my, what I understand from the staff, lots of positive feedback. So Thank well you. done and greatly appreciated by all of us. Liz, you've contributed over 5,000 hours and did over 160 kilometers. Well done, that's a marvelous <laughs> feat. Now, while Liz is here, I'm aware that your husband is yes. unable to join us yes. this morning. Uh, Liz's husband, Greg, he started back in 2008, uh, and Greg was a regular driver who, who often drove more than once a week and would assist at the last minute as well. So mm -hmm. uh, you both were out and about all the time, by the sounds of it. And Greg has contributed over 3,000 hours and over 109,000 kilometres. So that's an enormous effort from one family. So congratulations Thank and you. pass on our best wishes to Greg. Well done. Thank you. John Nildner. Where's you? Where are there you are, John, hiding back there? <coughs> John, you've been with us for a long time, haven't you? Not long enough. Hey, not long <laughs> enough. John volunteered back in 1999 and had, had has now decided to retire after 20 years. 20 years he has been a regular driver and made a commitment to drive at least once a week and whilst also helping out at any last minute trips. John, you... I'm led to believe that you're also popular with our clients and you're very courteous, friendly, and the staff are always happy to see your smiling face. And, and what a way to greet people with a smiling face. So, John, well done. You've, you've travelled over 150,000 kilometres as well. 
lots of trips in that, and, and you've in, obviously enjoyed it. I know Adelaide pretty well. You do. <laughs> <laughs> you've been up every little alleyway at <laughs> some stage. Uh, congratulations to you, sir. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Joylene Seppel. Joylene has been, you've been active in our visitor centre for a long time. And what a wonderful name to be presented with. Carter of Bad Luck. Well, you know, <laughs> Seppel's and the history of the Barossa, it goes together really well in our visitor centre. So well done, Joylene. You began volunteering back in 2003. And for 17 years, you've assisted on a regular basis, mostly working on Sundays, which was really appreciated as it was usually hard to find people to fill the Sunday shift by the sounds of it, but you were always fronted up. So congratulations and we sincerely thank you for that. Joylene has also helped countless visitors to experience the region to its fullness and you make time for those extra little special little conversations along the way. So well done. Even the staff could always learn something from you, Joylene. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what they said. <laughs> you know, sometimes younger people don't listen, but obviously they have. So they've learned a lot from you and we really appreciate that. Um, especially the Brosses Rich Heritage, which yes. we're also proud of. So uh, it's always been a pleasure for the team to work with you. And I know they will sincerely miss you. But they have said, keep on popping in because, you know, you know, they need to be updated all the time. So your, your wealth of knowledge we can't lose. Oh, I think and, I'm going backwards. Oh, go <laughs> on. But I tell you what, some of the stories and the conversations are, are very, very much appreciated. So we cherish your contribution that you've given to the visit the Centre. So you. congratulations to you. <laughs> Tell us a few stories of some of the people that's popped in. Oh, it's just been a joy, really, to be there. Um, luckily, I had some experience in the hospitality industry over 35 years, so, um, yes, I have been able to draw some stories from our experiences, yeah. and uh, I think the staff are just amazing, and what a team we've got. No, we appreciate that, yeah. and thank you very much. Thank you. Now, anybody else want to tell a story on one of your trips? What was the most interesting character you had in your car, in your vehicle? Got any stories? Oh, Rex, you're always good for a story. No. <laughs> so on behalf of everybody here, thank you so much for your wonderful contribution to this council and to the community and the wider region. So. Thank you so much. Some photos. We might do that out in there for you. Yeah, I need to do a little. Yeah, I'd better do that properly. We can we Members, can we just have a, sh a short move, move. Councillor Angus, a short adjournment, and second Councillor Johnston? All those in favour? Carrie, thank you. No, five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes.
Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, councillors. Um, visitors to the meeting, we have um, the uh, chairperson, John Durden, and uh, the CEO, Kathy, Kathy Wills from uh, Tourism Barossa. So we'll hand over to you for your presentation. So welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Mayor Bim. Um, so yeah, just anyone who hasn't met, met, met me before, whatever, there's too many in the room. Uh, John Durden, Chair of Tourism Barossa, uh, and Kathy Wills, the Regional Tourism Manager from Tourism Barossa. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, we, um, we really value the opportunity to, to speak to Council um, generally once a year to, to give an update on, um, on the role that we're playing, I guess, the state of the, uh, the tourism industry and, um, and hopefully for, for Council to, to see the value of the, um, of the contribution and important contribution that you actually are making to, um, to Tourism Barossa, but more importantly to the, uh, to the tourism uh, economy in, in the Barossa. Um, the um, Barossa Council, Tourism Barossa, have had a long partnership um, and, and, and it's been very important about the stability of having a, a strong regional tourism organisation. The past 12 months um, have shown the, the, the real benefit of the, the strength of that relationship and I guess the flexibility of that relationship that we've been able to demonstrate um, through some pretty uh, challenging times. The, the coming together of Barossa Council, Light Regional Council, Tourism Barossa and, and BGWA, um, particularly through the, the, the key crisis periods at the start of COVID, um, showed a, a great um, demonstration of the ability for, for our organisations um, to, to move quickly and, and adapt to the needs of our industry uh, at a very challenging time. And believe me, it was a very, very challenging time for our, for our tourism operators. Um, initially, understanding the impact and, and how, to, how to respond uh, with increasing uh, levels of, um, of controls and, and regulations, um, then um, working out what, what next and supporting uh, businesses um, with, a, with a clear intent from, from Tourism Barossa. Um, we really had one overall intent, which, which was that that, that uh, tourism businesses would survive uh, through this. Um, so at the start, that's dealing with uh, sort of health information and how to, how to manage facilities and how to improve cleaning and, and providing a facilitation between uh, operators and, and government services. Uh, and progressively then how to take up opportunities as, um, as we've seen some level of recovery. Um, I'll talk a little bit later just about the current state of where, where tourism's at, but um, I thought it's um, just important to, to recognise some of the key relationships um, you know, with it that, that Council supports. Um, so the Council's investment into the, the Visitor Information Centre um, is, a, is a really important um, aspect of supporting the, 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 the visitor economy and, um, and also through provision of um, expertise on our board um, Councillor uh, Boothby and also um, Joe uh, Seabrook, uh, who, who make a really important contribution to, to our board and the leadership of our board. Um, Council's ongoing investment in, in tourism related infrastructure. Um, I think probably the highlight for me um, this year, the, the Anguston Adventure Playground. Um, you know, I, I operate a, a, a business um, that's ultimately selling alcohol. And um, you'd, you'd ask, well, why does that, um, you know, why does uh, an adventure playground help me? But I saw, saw immediately on the opening of that a change in our clientele and actually a, an opportunity for families to, to experience all aspects of, um, of a visitation to the Barossa. Um, you know, we'd see, we'd see young families come in uh, early in the morning with the, the you yeah, hold on, this is mum's moment for half an hour but we'll be in the playground at 12. And that's actually had a really positive impact um, combined with great offerings like um, the Discovery Parks um, and the, um, and the, the New Rupert Caravan Park, which, which are actually doing a really great job at catering to, to that important audience. Um, funding for key hallmark events, including the Tour Down Under, the Barossa Vintage Festival, really helped for us to highlight um, the Barossa and bring profile to the Barossa, which is really important in in, uh, in building visitation. Um, I, I can't not uh, 
thank you for the, the, the financial contribution that you make on an ongoing basis to our organisation. Um, between uh, local government and state government contributions, that represents about half of the income to tourism Barossa each year, and, and, um, and council is a really important part of that. Um, and, and this year, the, the responsiveness of council to understand the need for additional funding focused on building confidence um, the, the money that's been, um, that's been co um, contributed by this council has helped us to be active in the market as a, as a marketing organisation in a way that we you know, probably have never done to that extent previously. Uh, and that's really important in a, in a period where confidence is, is low or difficult to maintain. Um, you know, that, that sort of investment has been a, a significant um, you know, benefit. Just a little bit of a, of a where we're at. Um, and I would have been a far more positive person um, 48 hours ago than I, than I am today. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think what we're seeing at the moment really reflects um, you know, where the industry are in that we're actually, we've seen um, quite a bit of recovery. Um, smaller operators, um, small accommodation, hosted accommodation saw, have seen quite a quick recovery. Um, larger um, cellar doors, larger, tour, larger um, accommodation providers have seen a slower recovery, but we were starting to see some really positive um, sort of position um, you know, in some of those larger operators and also tour operators I'll put into that, that same sort of, um, sort, sort of basket. But the overarching um, you know, um, feedback is really uncertainty uh, and, and the risk of uncertainty. We've seen that now. Um, what I'll say um, yeah, are the learnings that we've had over the past six months, I think, position us well to respond more quickly, uh, more comprehensively this time. Um, but I've just got to say there's uh, fingers are just firmly crossed at the moment that what we that the news in the next 48 hours is better than the, the news in the last 48 hours. Um, otherwise, we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll probably be regrouping and working out what our, what our next steps are um, pretty quickly. Mm. Uh, I'd like to echo John's thanks to the Barossa Council, uh, reflecting on the really excellent partnership that we enjoy uh, as two organisations. <clears throat> and as John's alluded, we're really fortunate to have a funding partner that doesn't just uh, partner fiscally, but invests in so many diverse ways into the visitor economy. So thank you for that. Um, I've used this slide previously, so I'm not... <clears throat> <clears throat> Pardon me, haven't had a coffee yet this morning. Um, <clears throat> I've used this slide previously in my um, presentation to council, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but I think it's an excellent visual reminder of the collaboration across the stakeholders within our visitor economy. It's often commented um, and affirmed from outside our region, and I think that strength of collaboration and community has set us in excellent stead during this extremely challenging year, and it tells you that we operate in a fairly complex uh, tourism ecosystem as far as the Barossa is concerned. Again, I'll just touch very briefly, I think everyone in the room are now is familiar with Tourism Barossa um, and our, uh, how we're made up. We're a member, membership-based organisation supporting approximately 270 member businesses across a diverse range of tourism sectors, cellar doors, accommodations, tour operators, events and service providers, retailers, wellness and more. And we support those in, in general times. We support those members through primary uh, objectives of destination development, destination marketing, delivery of festival and events. And an easy way to remember mm -hmm. Tourism Bros's remit is that we, we work internally with um, industry and trade, whereas the Brosser VIC tends to work with industry and trade, but externally with consumers. And uh, John's already touched on our um, funding and our staffing profile is the equivalent to FTEs, which I think creates a small and agile team. Um, <clears throat> Tourism Bros's annual acquittal report has been tabled with council today, I think, um, and it specifically addresses the entire 2019-2020 funding year. However, today our presentation is going to reflect uh, the latter part of that funding period and also some of this present funding period so that we can address some of the recovery marketing strategies that we're engaged with and you're partnering with financially. The initial nine or say six months of this year have delivered the greatest challenges to the tourism of the Barossa's visitor economy that I've witnessed in my tenure um, with the early effects of um, the national bushfire crisis and then the dramatic unfolding of a, a global pandemic. Tourism Barossa's board and team responded swiftly to the crisis and refocused our organisation's priorities to reflect the immediate needs of the region and our businesses and our community. 
We worked to support our members during this period through um, some very clear priorities that we um, outlined as on your screen, crisis comms and advice to control and correct the message. Mayor Bim will um, remember, I'm quite sure vividly, the high profile media attention due to the initial South Australian COVID cluster occurring in the Barossa. Uh, we were involved in advocacy for the region with SA Health and the Premier so that the messaging was um, favourable for our region. General member support and triaging member concerns and questions and really pastoral care for the hundreds of businesses that are our members. Regular and at times daily communication with members on policy updates and a rapidly shifting legislative framework and advice, support um, and information on financial grants um, and business support. I'd like to note at this time the excellent support provided from Martin McCarthy and Mayor Laney during this time, firstly to our region, um, to Tourism Brossa as an organisation and to myself personally. And I just wanted to thank you both for that. Uh, also to Jo Seabrook and her team who demonstrated an agility and professionalism in, in the, the, the delivery of really impressive visitor servicing despite um, the constantly shifting policy framework. So thank you for that, Jo. And also acknowledge our chair, John Durden, who provided our board and team with outstanding leadership, and to my colleagues within Tourism Brossa who invested tirelessly into a region that they all love. Where to from here? Tourism Brossa typically operates within a four-year strategic planning framework, which expired in June 2020. And in light of the uncertainty of the COVID-19 period, our board has determined to activate a 12-month recovery business plan just for this um, year. That's also been tabled as part of your requital report. And I invite you to familiarise yourself um, at your leisure with the outcomes. But again, the key outcomes are highlighted on the, the screen. They reflect somewhat our activity during the crisis of COVID-19 and then some more strategic activities. And our board is undertaking a comprehensive planning exercise this year and will deliver um, or table a strategic plan that will go from July 2021. And I imagine that will also be in a four year block. <clears throat> With the immediate loss of international markets, quickly followed by the loss of interstate domestic markets, it became evident that a strategic uh, recovery marketing campaign would be essential to, to drive the immediate intrastate visitation and the medium term interstate visitation that the Brossa desperately needed in the middle of the crisis. The Brossa Council has invested heavily into the region for COVID-19 recovery overall. And I would like to acknowledge the significant investment that you've made into specifically into recovering marketing over three financial years. So thank you for partnering with this vital activity. Quickly in passing, our social media strategy laid a foundation for this recovery marketing. Um, since March, in the height of the COVID crisis, we've increased, increased our use of social media channels as a way to engage directly with audiences in South Australia and interstate and to ensure that we remained front of mind for all future travel. Obviously, we were waiting for COVID restrictions to diminish internally within South Australia and at our borders. And we use a strategic marketing approach to highlight different experiences with calls to action simply being aspirational until borders were open and we could actually go for a book now. Um, and you'll notice a very significant engagement in our social media channels during this six month period and that was simply due to increased activity. The key partners of the recovery market plan that, uh, campaign that's in market now include the Brossa Council, South Australian Tourism Commission and Tourism Brossa. And our quarter one and two campaign activity has really focused on continuing to position the Barossa as a destination of choice for our very important interstate market and then targeting relevant interstate markets as the state borders were opened. We intentionally aligned this campaign with South Australian Tourism Commission's very significant investment um, into marketing so we could leverage their superior spend. Uh, this slide reflects outcomes of the significant investment across um, three platforms, one free to air within South Australia, secondly connected TV or streaming services in Queensland and New South Wales and then native digital advertising in those three states. The activations delivered, delivered outstanding ROI. I've got some highlights on the screen, um, things like 9.3 million impressions through the digital advertising with 39 and a bit thousand click-throughs through to Brossa.com. Like Brossa they were very, very um, extensive returns on that investment. Also, there was an error in our favour where a supplier accidentally provided us more than double the advertising we purchased. Um, so, <laughs> some, so some of those, they when the report landed yesterday, they highlighted, don't get too excited about that report for future campaigns because some of that was their error. 
uh, which we're incredibly grateful for. Um, and also, there was a little bit of generosity from TV, TV um, because they realised it was the first campaign that Tourism Brossa had put to market for a very long time, and I think they were sweetening the deal. Uh, we also placed editorial inver and advertisements in glossy magazines, which aligned with our recovery marketing outcomes, including leverage the, leveraging the increased interest in self-drive, a great market for us at the moment, repositioning the Barossa as a summer destination and highlighting nature and the great outdoors. Se several titles were Caravanning Australia and the SA Food and um, Wine, SA Life Food and Wine publication. We realise, and I'm sure many of you do as well, the vulnerability facing our tourism sector this summer, as it is traditionally a time of lower visitation and it is traditionally smoothed out to some degree by international visitation. We recognise JobKeeper has finished for some businesses, although JobKeeper 2.0 is providing some support for others. To counter the perception that the Barossa is not a summer, day ho summer holiday destination, we've invested significantly into a reclaimed summer campaign both a glossy print and a three-month digital advertising campaign from November, December and January. And our aim is to capture the domestic market who otherwise would be considering a beachside or riverside holiday and entice them to consider the Barossa as an unexpected um, summer destination. As we close, it might seem counterintuitive to be courting the international market at this stage. However, it's important that we continue to position the Barossa brand <coughs> in front of our key international markets 12 to 18 months, which is the horizon that we feel we won't be receiving international <coughs> visitors in. 12 to 18 months is a relatively short time frame in the international tourism distribution system. So we've made contact with our counterparts in um, New Zealand in the early outbreak of COVID, and this has resulted in SATC promoting the Barossa extensively in New Zealand at this point in time. I attended the North America marketplace and the UK European marketplace virtually during October and November. Normally I would attend them in Los Angeles and London, um, but these were uh, facilitated on Zoom platforms internationally. So we acknowledge we won't be receiving guests from these markets, but it's important that we keep those long-term relationships. And finally, we're really looking forward to delivering the 2021 Brossa Vintage Festival, and we see it as a vital uh, community celebration. Our region is extremely fortunate to have the services of Festival Director Jenny O'Brien, whose task is complicated this year due to important COVID safe compliant requirements, and she's been liaising with SA Health and SA Police to ensure the festival is delivered safely for our community and attendees. The financial aspects of this festival are extremely challenging, um, with the challenge of securing sponsors in these tenuous economic times. Again, we're grateful to the Barossa Council for the additional 20,000 of sponsorship which is assisting in underpinning a very significant sponsorship deficit. Uh, as you know, Gourmet Weekend brand was retired in October 2019, and we're looking forward to scoping a new culinary festival for August 2021. So thank you for your attention this morning. We greatly appreciate being able to present to our partners um, and for your time on the agenda. In, as a region, we've faced the unprecedented challenges that 2020 has delivered, and it's been heartening to see the resilience and community spirit that has carried us through to date. We acknowledge, as John already has, the resurfacing uncertainty during, uh, due to the recent COVID-19 outbreak. However, I'm confident that the past nine months demonstrates that together, the Barossa is well able to weather any of the turbulence that comes our way. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Both of you for your presentation. Um, any questions, comments that anyone may have? Councillor Lee Smith. Um, first of all, thanks Cathy and John for coming along. Um, I know you've both had a very challenging year dealing with <laughs> the events of the year, um, and we really appreciate the time that you've taken to come today, but also the extra time you put in this year to help our community get through those challenges. Um, I do have a couple of questions from uh, the reports that you supplied to us. So um, my first one is in regards to Deliverable 2, supporting the Brussels Council and its community groups in the successful delivery of other events. Um, I think while Tourism Barossa is a heavily membership-based organisation, we need to keep in mind the funding component from Barossa Council also um, takes into consideration non-members. So I'm just wondering if you can give us any examples of how you've supported the broader community or other businesses who may not be members. I think actually that uh, funding point, I'd have to check back the exact um, part of the contract, I think that comes under additional funding when we do 
and we have in the past struck additional funding for those four points that nest underneath it. But I left it in there because we actually have done them even without that um, additional funding. So I think some good um, examples of that are when, particularly around events, when non-members with um, Tourism Grossa um, are looking to put, like the Vintage Festival was a fantastic example. There are many non-members of Tourism Brossa who look to put on um, events during the Vintage Festivals and sometimes in other um, events. And our team is available and invests heavily where, where required, you know, to assist it's often church groups and um, community groups. A very occasionally it might be businesses, but typically they are our um, members already. And so that capability building and capacity building marketing their events, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, um, that support is available for those um, people as required. And just in a more general sense, um, have you been approached to provide any support for, say, some of the fringe areas of the Barossa that perhaps, you know, don't get quite so involved in some of these events? Fringe areas of the Barossa Council area or the Barossa Yeah, yeah, of the Barossa Council area, that's what I'm saying. So if we um, speak about Southern Barossa or, say, um, Eden Valley Springton in that way, mm. obviously there's a, there's a lot of... Um, businesses in those areas that I'm aware aren't members yes, but yeah. um, could benefit from that support. Yeah. Have you been approached? Or? Yes, not specifically in events, but um, I've been spending some time with the Southern Brossa Business Alliance, the newly formed subgroup under Southern Brossa Alliance, and um, have been working with their executive committee and also have made a commitment to come to some of their uh, committee meetings really as a capacity development um, exercise there. And my colleague, um, Jess Great, which has been working in the Eden Valley, um, there are numbers of groups. One of the groups is a member of ours, uh, Eden Valley Tourism Promotional Group, and then other groups. So we work with them on, um, on request because, again, you know, we see our remit as developing a great Barossa destination, not just as supporting our members and some of the, sometimes the smaller and less um, commercial aspects of the Barossa, other things that bring us light and shade. And also, I haven't touched on it here, but I know that um, Joe's um, prom reported to council when you um, affirmed a budget of twenty thousand dollars for the town villages, towns, and town villages, towns, ships, and trails project, which we're also putting fifteen thousand dollars towards. And Joe and her team and my team will be meeting with all um, township groups on the thirtieth of November to to um, kickstart that project. And that will offer um, support via those townships to businesses who aren't members of Tourism Brossa at the moment, who may in the future become so or, or may not. So, yeah, so, so incidentally, we provide um, extensive support across the, across the region. The other bit I would add to that, um, the, the significant step up in, uh, in destination marketing activity uh, through this year um, I think the positive from that perspective is that has a broad effect on visitation to the entirety of the Barossa, uh, which, which plays to direct tourism businesses, but also in indirect tourism businesses uh, very, very heavily. Um, in, in that, we've, there is recognition that, um, that the current model of operation isn't necessarily perfect between various industry groups um, around the way that we support and, and, and market the brand. Uh, and there is strong and significant work going on to to ensure the relevance um, you know, of that structure is um, you know, is developed over time to to ensure that the way that we present, market, support, and prom promote the brand is being done in the most effective way, um, and and not necessarily uh, with only the interest of a of a membership type organisation um, sitting behind it. So there's, there's significant work happening there. And I'm sure that, that, um, that the council has a, um, a seat at the table in all of those discussions and I'm sure that they'd be, be updated when that's appropriate. Council, please speak. As a, as a board member of Tourism for us in terms of the member versus non-member thing, one of the things to keep in mind too is that, so as, as John was saying, when we have a national campaign or a state campaign on TV, the, the tourism... Um, Operators, whether you're a member or not member, benefit from that. Mm. One of the challenges for our members is that they're, they're actually providing funding to benefit people who don't contribute as members. Yeah. So you know they're actually carrying the can really for a whole. You know, there's a whole number of Airbnbs who benefit from that advertising who contribute absolutely nothing in terms of you know organisations like Tourism Barossa. So I was appreciate the, the concerns around non-member versus member benefits. We really, really appreciate our members and the only thing that kept us alive as an organisation in 2009-10 when SATC pulled its funding out was the fact that we had a really strong membership base. 
So those members are exceptionally important, um, you know, both from a revenue point of view and showing support and, you know, it's how we're still here, basically. Um, so, yes, yeah, so non-members get a huge benefit. Yeah, and taking yeah. nothing away from that. But I think, you know, as a council, we're responsible for the broader region, sure. not just members, and that's the reasoning for my yeah. question. Um, I've got one more, but if someone else... Go for it. <laughs> um, I'm going to sound like a broken record because I asked a similar question last year, but my particular area of interest, obviously, is around social media, um, and that's something that comes under deliverables 3, 6 and 8. Um, <coughs> You've provided some statistics this year, which is really helpful. Um, thanks for that. I'm just wondering if the 10% increase has been achieved because it's not a year-on-year -year comparison, so we can see sort of where you've been going this year. Um, but also in addition to that, what sort of strategies, and I know you've already outlined some of them in your presentation, but what strategies are being employed to um, encourage organic growth of the social media channels um, as opposed to paid growth? And I think this is particularly relevant right now. I mean, <laughs> we've sort of calmed down a bit from the events earlier in the year, but I think we're going to see this again and see just how important social media is to attracting visitors to our region. Mm. So being the numbers guy, I'll deal with the 10% one, <laughs> um, in, in that that's actually been well and truly achieved and, and actually um, more than achieved even in the last six, yeah, in the last six months. So, um, so I, but 10% but in, in this area is not a, not is not a massive, is not a massive challenge. Um, and I think too, I, I may have prefaced this last year, but I preface it whenever I have an, a chance as far as social media, that while it, it is in, an important channel and we um, share it with the Bross Council, the Bross Visitor Information Centre, um, our remit typically is actually industry and trade. So the fact that we communicate to um, consumers at all via our social media channels is a little anomalous um, for our organisation. It's a legacy issue. Uh, and also, it's not um, there. There are not hours and hours and hours of time um, from the PR and marketing budget allocated to that. So I just preface with that. Um, the organic reach question, I think, is is really good and has been very well proven here. Uh, Taryn Wills activated an excellent campaign through um, COVID nineteen, which was basically sourcing content for our social channels um, from businesses and community members. It was called My Bros a Day. And we aimed to get 30 um, different itineraries up. I think we ended up with 24 or 25. And the reach from those kinds of campaigns, which were promoted via our socials, and all kinds of dreaming and aspirational um, activities that were posted through the social channels there were, were highly successful. We don't have a large social media advertising budget. It might be in the numbers of thousands. Um, you know, so for some people that might be a week's, you know, socials or a month's socials, but ours might be a $30 boost here or a $200 boost there. So it's really paid advertising is not really something that Tourism Brossa does a lot of. So the creativity required for our social content is, you know, heightened. And I think that these um, stats, and I'm glad you noticed them because I put them in particularly for you <laughs> because I remembered, your question, I remembered your question from last year. So they, and they are very heartening and, and very strong. Yeah, so thank you. Any further questions? So thank you <coughs> both for coming along uh, again, and uh, I, I must say that this, whilst, whilst we've got this uncertainty, there's still lots of really exciting opportunities, and uh, I know how well that uh, the Warren and the South Power has sort of brought another aspect into our region, and the uh, the summer campaign about what, what 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 we have in our region as far as that's concerned. Um, the government's going to expand the car parking because it's overflows at the Warren Reservoir, so it's a really a matter of how we can capture and keep on that collaboration. I think there'd be some valuable stats that we could probably source from um, SA Water who've got cameras and numbers and things like that, so I think we bring that into it. And, of course, the, the Pusey Vale single-track mountain bikers, you log on to their website and the amount of numbers that are going into that area as well as if, even the your website associated with fishing in that area. So there's some good, great opportunities which has provided some diverse tourism opportunities but also the, the, the cap capabilities of having more accommodation within our region. My cycling mates that wanted to come up and stay the weekend couldn't find accommodation on the weekend. So that was a great thing for our region. So we've got a lot of things to come together. Thank you both for coming along. Uh, I compliment you both for your enthusiasm and your energy that you, you bring to the uh, 
to the region and some of the collaboration that we've, <laughs> we've been talking about and, and how we can move forward collectively and uh, protect that wonderful brand Barossa. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, someone move and second that, that we... Uh, um, the, the uh, report from the Ross yeah, Tourism. Good report. Yes, I'll move Thank that you. Yep. Councillor Hearn and second to Councillor Habeck. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you. Thank, Thank you both. You. Yes, we will now return to the two. Is that what you're putting I your was hand just going up to for? Suggest, can I move that we've received a note of two reports that I withdrew earlier? Yes, thank you. One second. Though. Second. All those in favour, those two consensus items, all those in favour, carry. Give me two seconds to fire up my computer again. Page 5.36. Members will now move to item 7.2.1.8, the Regional Australia, uh, Brussels Light, Gawler and Adelaide Plains. Uh, constitutional changes, consultation, CEO. Mr Mayor, I have a conflict of interest, I'm a member of the board. Um, I will remain to answer any questions but remove myself prior to any vote. Any questions? Uh, Councillor uh, Angus. Thanks Mayor. Uh, in the recommendation on page 536, um, second line, that noting council in a future revision. Can I have a, an explanation of that? <coughs> Is it a future version, future vision, revision? It's a revision of a future constitution. Okay, thank you. Can I also go to page... 538, first page of the RDA, first line. RDA was established pursuant to a memorandum of Broome. Is there any explanation what the memorandum of Broome is? So, my understanding is that the initial RDA framework, yes, I, good question, I didn't pick that one Sorry. up. Sorry. <laughs> Lucky I didn't write that document. No, I can tell you didn't write it. <laughs> my understanding is the, and I can, I, can, I might have to take it and clarify it, which I can put in the minutes, but I understand the original memorandum to establish RDAs as a principle was um, established in Broome. It should have had an E on yeah, it then. But it should have. If it had an E but Let me just double check that and I will clarify in the minutes. Oh, so it's a good pick good up. Explanation. Thank, Thank you. Coeg? Any further questions? If not, yeah. CEO has removed himself from the chamber. Three seconds. We we'll have a mover and a seconder. Move Councillor Angus, seconded Councillor Wee Smith. All those in favour? Carry. Sorry to be pedantic, man. No, oh, that's all right. That's well done. <laughs> Well done. Hopefully the new legislation keeps us <coughs> uh, The next item is the annual financial statements 2019-2020 on um, page 555. Any questions of Mr Laird? No questions? So I'd like to move the motion. I'll move that way. Move Councillor Johnston. Seconded Councillor Schilling. All those in favour? Carry. Page 653. 653.7.2.2.2 is the report on the financial results 2019-2020. Any questions? Someone like to move the motion? Recommendation? Councillor Hearn has moved. A seconder. Councillor Schilling. All those in favour? 
Carry. On page six nine six. We have the budget update 2020-2021 as of uh, 30th of September 2020. Any questions that you may have on the budget update at this particular time? Someone like to move? Move Councillor Johnston, seconded Councillor Miller. All those in favour? Carry. Page 722, 7.2.2.4, the monthly financial report as of the 31st of October 2020. Any questions? <coughs> question? Oh, just a question, Mr Lager. Are there any um, revenue cash flow implications through the present financial situation? Um, Thank you, Mr Lager. And through you... Yeah. Not at this stage, there isn't any cash flow issues at this point in time. Uh, we did provide for a substantial amount of um, loans for the um, 1920 the past year and also the 2021 year, which we haven't needed to draw down on due to the fact that um, we didn't build all the capital expenditure during 1920. That has been carried forward into 2021 in the main. So during this financial year, if we continue with that capital program, and the council's just adopted the carried forwards just in the previous report, um, yes, we will be re required to draw down on some of those loans during this year if we continue to build those projects as per the capital program. If we don't build those capital program, then we probably won't need that amount of loan funding. We do have facilities set up that council approved back in June, July. Uh, May, June, should say, for um, cash advance to venture with the LGFA at the special rate. Um, and that facility is set up there ready to, to access if we need it. But we do have substantial funds in our cash and investments account at the moment coming through our revenue that we raise during the year for a rate revenue and so forth. So we do have substantial funds in it at the moment. It all depends on if we're successful with some more grant funding applications, and if they're successful, then that will bring those programs forward. And then we still have to be able to build those programs and have the capacity, and that includes capacity of the workforce that doesn't work for council to be able to build those things as well. So it depends on a lot of factors. If all those things come to line, yes, we will be requiring to access some more loans. Okay. For the question, uh, and rates are, rate payments are flowing in as we would expect? Yes, they are. We do have some deferrals in place. Um, we've had one remission application, another one in the pipeline. Um, the council's um, a provision for those there. And we do have deferrals that are in place till the end of January. Um, and, and they haven't moved a great deal since the original applications. When things change because of events this week, there's another thing because our rates are due the first week of December. So whether we um, get something coming further from that is to be seen. Thank you. Any further questions? Someone like to move? Councillor Wee Smith seconded. Councillor Miller. All those in favour? Carry. Page 725, 7.2.2.5, the minutes of the Order Committee meeting and the extension and the appointment of two independent members. Any questions in respect to the Audit Committee report? Move the record now. Move Councillor Angus, seconded Councillor Miller. All those in favour? Carried. Page 7, 5, 4, 7.3.1.1, 7 
the proposed community consultation aquatic services. Any questions? I'd like to move recommendation two. Moved Councillor Havick, recommendation two. Councillor Schilling, you second. seconding. Any questions? If Councillor Boothby? Just following on from discussion earlier with regard to the notice of, of motion that obviously um, had limited debate. Um, in terms of the information that will provide further clarification in terms of the current pool, um, so my understanding from talking to the CEO is that there'll be a minimum amount of information on all four um, options for the community, or five options, is the first option's no, that's easy, for the, no feasibility required on that one. The four, four options for, that involve expenditure will have a certain amount of feasibility work done. I guess my, my question is, um, so in order for a future council, regardless of this consultation, to now enact um, the direction for staff, which is around the, the benefits of that investment outweighing the costs, what additional information will be produced to inform that discussion in terms of any future council having the ability to actually do that? Um, and how will that be presented as part of this consultation so that the community beyond just near Yotva um, can actually have some way of actually now with the complexity of pathway to uh, being able to navigate that in a way that they can actually have an informed decision. Yes, so yeah, three years now. Thanks, Councillor Griffey. Um, yeah, that's an extensive question. So, absolutely, the intent uh, is to do feasibility, but obviously includes both cost, benefit, um, social, and community outcomes as a baseline to inform, as you say, the four particular options. And, and as you rightly say, if the community say no, then there is no feasibility. Um, the, the, the broader construction of, um, of option two is much more complex in terms of its staging process. And um, there will be trigger points at which we'll need to come back and talk to council throughout this process. So um, the, the development of those feasibility studies will not be a feasibility study of the magnitude of a master plan it will be the, the um, an assessment, essentially, as I say, of cost, benefit, social, and the research that um, a chunk of the research that already exists in the draft strategy, and pulling that out into a digestible component. Um, in terms of how we present this to the community, yes, we're still trying to work through that with Wax's support. Um, but there are some um, smarts that we will hopefully use through our new bait and table tool as well. Um, looking over to the right, and I haven't actually talked to Mrs. Hill Big about that bit yet, but I will. And, um, and try to get a really simple cascading decision making tree through that process. It's a little bit around the circle, I know, but um, now that we have this direction, we can put more meat around those particular ones. So, in summary, yes, feasibility studies that look at both economic cost, social benefit, community benefit, digestible pieces of information that align with the strategy of each particular decision point, and there'll be trigger points that need to come back to council before we trigger the next steps, as well as using some smarts as to how we could try and relay that information. Well, I'm really, really mindful to not bog this down in design by committee. Um, that in my view, is one of the problems we've had for the last three or four years. We just have to get to a point. This is not going to be perfect because it is actually quite uh, complex, and then we'll see what we get, and we'll go again and figure it out as as we get the information back from the community. Any further question, from me? Yes. So obviously, this is a you know, substantially high level draft, and I understand that Wax will be involved in finessing the questions. Um, so the pathway one had not had a township location, specifically in terms of the need for new or additional outdoor aquatic facilities. This one is specific about New Yorkshire. So it'll be interesting the way that first question is crafted. And at the moment, it's not actually a yes, no answer. 
is what aquatic facilities do you consider needed in Europe? But that's not a yes no. So in order to have that be a yes no, that will be interesting to see how that um, is crafted in the end, mm -hmm. and whether or not that's going to actually. I guess at the end of the day, I totally understand what the chamber and the staff are trying to do in terms of bringing the community along this journey. I just caution that this is potentially about to get way more complicated than it has been so far um, in terms of just being able to craft that sufficiently well to actually get through to you know, any, any decision-making stage if it's going to be exceptionally complex. Uh, through you, Mr. Um, I'm just going to agree um, what you have to understand with pathway two is as officers we were scrambling based on a um, obviously we've had four weeks from the previous, or well, six weeks from the previous resolution, so um, that will have to have refinement and some of those questions are actually not even waxes, they're literally myself and Mrs Thomas trying to work on something to give you a direction. Any further questions? Councillor Havick, do you wish to speak to the motion? I just think that this follows on from the earlier motion and uh, if we're going to go ahead with it, we need to do the consultation and uh, this is it. Yeah. So, and I know there's going to be some issues down the track, but uh, as it may, we need to get on with it, I think. Uh, it's the future we're looking at here. So, uh, I'm totally supportive. Thank you. Councillor Shelley? Uh, no, thank you to the CEO for the explanation of the process from here. That was... Um, uh, covered all my questions or um, uh, concerns that I had and just like to thank uh, my fellow elected members for listening to the community and um, making the change that we have today. So, Thank you. Um, any further debate? <coughs> I don't suppose you want to close the debate then? <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're happy? With I'll close the debate, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All those in favour, recommendation two, that is carried. Page 768 is the um, grant application from the Mount Mackenzie <coughs> Hall, incorporated on item 7.3.2.1. Any questions first? Not? I'd like no. to have an alternative motion. I'd like to speak against it and actually fund the project. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Carry on. Okay. Um, through uh, discussions with the uh, CEO yesterday, I uh, said I would uh, come up with an alternative motion. I've uh, drafted an alternative motion. It's uh, I'm no master in drafting alternative motions, but uh, um, I, I, I have done it. I'm quite happy to provide a copy for uh, members to uh, consider. So this is only a recommendation, the CEO. So you haven't sent me that motion? No, I don't. Can you send it to me now? Or just yes, now? I can send it to you right now. Can you send it to Marissa? Yeah, I'll just... There is no motion, you can just say you can move whatever you like. Yes, this is only a recommendation, so this is a, a, a motion. If you wish to put it's that like forward legal. once we have it, and then we will consider it. Should be coming over now to you and Marissa. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Whilst that's coming through, and we get that up on screen, um, and I will put this in the minutes. But to clarify, that Broom should have had an E, and I was <laughs> correct. <laughs> Research on the run. Well done. I think that would be similar to the borough charter. Uh, any heritage conservation is known as the borough charter because that's where that was started off in Australia. Mm
Jeez, eh? Yes, I did. Maybe you could just take your laptop around. I'll have enough to go at it. No. Well, sometimes the servers can be slow. It's not coming up a cent. Text. <laughs> yeah, you read out what you've got. Oh, I'm just going to break it up for you, boys. Now, can I ask a question? Um, with the community assistance grant that was approved for three thousand dollars, does that include, or does that then change what was decided at the community in the community assistance grant? Because that's already three thousand of that amount's already been approved. Yeah. As I understand it, we, yeah, we we only have delegation up to that amount. If council yes. now chooses to fund the whole amount, so then that, that money will come from the, council. And the cask will remain; it won't be spent. No, no, it'll, it'll go. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, well, two yachts in one minute. Well, it's a three-point uh, uh, recommendation. Is number one, note the situation at Mount Mackenzie regarding an adequate supply of water to assist in any bushfire event. Listen, can I suggest we either adjourn this sort of out or yeah. I'll move on and I'll get it off. Yeah. What we'll do is we'll, adjourn, we'll, we'll put this one on hold with the leave of the meeting, and we'll move on to the next item while we sort it out. Yeah, Councillor nice suggestions. I had actually sent the CEO um, a question on this one because part three didn't actually give any direction to staff. So with Councillor Barrett's <coughs> consideration, basically <coughs> what um, suggested. So if part C is that the council determines that yep. the community risk or infrastructure of this nature outweighs the proposed process requirements in this instance and approves the recommendation rec recommend expenditure, yep. which basically says we've got 3,000 from that bucket, 11,992 from that bucket, and on the basis of public risk, we are prepared to, to, to fund that amount. That was my suggestion. Councillor Barrett, does that affect what you were trying to achieve? Yes, it was a, that was in effect what I was trying so to say. I'm happy to move that way, that the part C of the recommendation... Part three, sorry, um, reads, and I'll read that again, which is basically council determines that the community risk for infrastructure of this nature outweighs the process requirements in this instance and approves the recommended expenditure. Can you flick that one through too? I've got it. You've got it.
Councilman Barrett, is that the two what you're on to the two? So that uh, it takes yeah. over. It does. Yeah. You're going to second top? Are you having a second? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're just hanging on it. Well, just so we can go back. Sure. Golden. We're gonna, I've got to work out which motion I'm going to accept, yours or, or uh, Councillor Boothby's. Uh, Martin's, uh, the CEO's got it now, so we put it up on the screen and we can just clarify. I'd encourage you all just if you have other motions to flick them in earlier, please. That will help us immensely. Situation of the Mount Mackenzie regarding an adequate supply of water to assist in any bushfire event. Part two is approved in addition to the 3,000 already granted from the community grants, an additional 11,292 from the community assets budget for the Mount Mackenzie Hall Community Firefighting Tank Project. That payment to the Mount Mackenzie Hall is subject to confirmation of planning and building approval and the project being fully funded. Are you happy with that, sir? You yes, move that, that way. If someone second that one, second Councillor Weaves. Question? Yes, Councillor Angus. Uh, a suggestion that you remove the word bush yes. fire. Uh, that means you wouldn't be able to use it for a house fire. Or a grass fire. So I think any fire event. Any emergency fire event. Are you happy with that? Yes, I'm happy for that. The second of those changes to occur. Thank you. Oh, sorry to be no. but That's the way people are these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd suggest also any fire event or emergency, because yes. you might be trying to wash down the road. Yeah. Or something. Can we just make it any emergency? Any emergency, yeah, emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Any emergency event. Yeah, roof fire. Just any emergency. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Johnson. No, no, no. I've got a mover and a seconder. Any questions? To the mover. You got a question, Councillor Havick? I'd just like to speak in favour of the motion. Be your pardon? What was that? I'd like to speak in favour of the motion. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll let the mover the mover like to speak. Uh, yes, please. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, this is a uh, matter that uh, I've followed through being a member of the Community Assistance Scheme. So it's, this is not just a one-off for me. I've watched it go through along with fellow Community Assistance Scheme uh, members. Um, and I found this a difficult one in as much as staff had to follow the directions we'd given in relation to new initiatives and they just could not put it up for approval, and but I do say thank you for the staff for the alacrity in bringing this back to council so we can uh, consider it. Um, I look longer term at the fires, not just within the Brossa council area, but uh, in a wider area throughout the Adelaide Hills, the Cuddley Creek, the Sampson Flat, uh, the Eden Valley fires of, of recent years. So it's, it's not a matter of... Uh, if a matter of when the next major fire occurs around the area, uh, for us to be uh, considering a matter like this, some people might consider why I'll be providing uh, 
such a, a service to such a small small town. I went back to the very basics and I looked at the functions of uh, of a, uh, of a uh, what we're supposed to do as a council. And the, there's a couple of very uh, pertinent points at uh, uh, section uh, seven of the uh, local government act, and I uh, just urge members to consider some of the things we are supposed to do. And these are the things we are supposed to do. To provide infrastructure for its community and for development within its area, including infrastructure that helps protect any part of the local broader community from any hazard or other event or that assist in the management of the area. So this is what this, this uh, uh, motion is all about. Uh, other ones, that talks about the, uh, uh, the danger. And then we uh, talk about... Uh, um, uh, to take measures to protect its area from natural and other hazards and to mitigate the effects of the hazards. Us providing a water tank definitely assists in that area. And then we might think uh, about water. And then I refer to uh, Section 7B, provide services and facilities that benefit its area, its rate base and residents and visitors of its area, including general public services or facilities, including electricity, gas and water services. So it's all spilled out there within the Local Government Act uh, for what we should be doing to um, you know, look after people in their area. And for such a small investment, I, I, I just urge members to uh, uh, consider this one and, and vote accordingly. So that's all I've got to say in relation to that one. So thank you. Councillor Lee Smith. Um, yeah, basically to reiterate what Councillor Barrett said, I think anything that we can do to support our communities um, to defend themselves in an emergency is something that we should absolutely be supporting without question. As we've done um, with the funding we've received through the Drought Communities Program, I see this as a small extension of that and yeah, that's what we're here to do. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? Councillor, um, Councillor Havick? Just going on from there, I think that what we need to do here also is look at the location of where Mount McKenzie is, the lack of water in that area. Um, between Angerston and Eden Valley and uh, look at the fire danger as it is at the moment. If you drive out through there you will see it's a, a cinder box waiting to happen. I would hate to see a situation arise there where there was lack of water for the fire units and that's what we're talking about. So I think the benefits far outweigh the cost and I can support it. Mm. I agree with you. I, I guess the thing is what we're supplying with these tanks is a small band-aid on what the bigger picture is in that region and we will continue to advocate. I don't think we're the, we're the providers of all those services but we'll continue to advocate on behalf of that community to ensure that there is uh, those provisions in the, in the not too distant future. I know there's been, uh, 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 we had a session up in um, Lambert Estate only a week or two ago with the uh, local federal member and the minister, federal minister for water, and it's very high on the agenda. And there's opportunities that a lot of people are um, collaborating together to try to come up with the right, right um, solution for that <coughs> area. So it's critical. Any other further comments? If not, put the motion. All those in favour? Carry. Members will move to the next item, 7.3.2.2, uh, the proposed opening hours 2020-2021 of the Rex Barossa Aquatic Fitness Centre and Outdoor Pools. Ironic, we're talking about the opening hours when we just had the shut, mm. so there we go. Anyway, hopefully we get through this and that will be open shortly. Any questions? Someone would like to move the motion? Councillor Miller and seconded Councillor Angus. All those in favour? Gary. Next item is the 7.3.2.3 um, on page 814. And this is to do with the... Uh, Nuriupa War Memorial Swimming Pool pilot increase opening operating <coughs> service levels and associated cost increases for season 2020 and 2021. Any questions that members may have? Councillor Barrett. 
And in the context of the recommendation, it does also include the Williamstown swimming pool, as documented in the report. So, question? Question. Question? <laughs> Councillor Louise Smith. Um, this may be a little bit pedantic, but I'm going to raise it now. In the weather policy, it talks about when the weather exceeds 26 degrees Celsius. So that means when it's 27 or above. Um, can we have that wording clarified? Because I think that could provide some confusion to people if they look at 26. They're going to think when it's 26 degrees, it's going to be open. I think the simplest answer to that is what he wants it to be, 25.9. I'd say when, it, when it says 26 degrees or above, yeah. it, at the moment it reads exceeds 26 degrees and I just think it's a little bit ambiguous. So, okay. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, when the, the weather is 26 degrees Celsius and above. So, sorry, Mr. Mayor, are you adding a fifth part to a resolution without putting words in anybody's name? I'm looking at the weather policy below that, so not the recommendation, but what we're actually talking about, the details. Yeah, okay, so three, you missed again. The, the, weather, the policy is the current policy, so you will need to pass something that says part five for the weather policy be updated to read 26 degrees That is some of the feedback that I have had, is that the, yeah. it's a bit confusing, so. I'm happy to add a part to the recommendation that updates that. Okay, okay. Is there any other further questions before I add that part? Mm -hmm. Councillor Boothby? I did read this, but I'm now confused. I thought Parliament was talking about removing the weather contingency, sure. so I'm not sure how... That was what I understood too. Yeah, and my, my further question to that is, with the data that um, Ms Tappert sent out to us recently, there is data, so on days that were under 26, the pool was open, so the temperatures in that... Excel spreadsheet and actually shows how many people were there on those days. Um, and it appears to be that on some of those days there were like two people there. Um, so I just, in terms of, like, I understand the feedback we're getting about um, people knowing whether or not the pool is open, but given that weather policies, as the report says, are pretty much standard for management of community pools, um, is there necessarily really you know, are we potentially over catering for that need if, if at the moment what the data it looks like is in days that it's cold, there's no one there. So I'm just, you know, at the end of the day, with the amount of investment we're making in the pool, it may be neither here nor there. My apologies, yeah. I misread this. Beg your pardon? I misread this, I'm just reading yeah, through it. I understood it was open, it was <laughs> open. And the idea that behind it all was, that, yeah, oh, when it's cold, no one's there because it's not open. So yeah. if it's open, they may still be... Is that my... Is that correct? Thank you. So I guess my question is, the impetus for removing the weather policy at all and basically having it open every day regardless of whether it's 12 degrees, um, I just want some more information around, um, the, the, I guess, the pros and cons of that, is that a sensible thing to be doing? Mr Tabbert, yeah, please. Oh, yes. No, you can. You, yep. Okay. Yep. That's fine. So the pros and cons, um, from my understanding and viewpoint, I guess, is that the benefit of removing a weather policy removes the inconsistency of people's understanding around is the pool going to be open or not open. The other thing it does is that we determine that weather point and you can select whatever temperature threshold you wish at 5 p.m. the previous day. So as we know, the weather isn't always completely accurate. So should it be 28 degrees when yesterday it was actually forecast to only be 25 degrees, we would, would sorry, would not be open at the moment. So that's, that's the benefit. Um, the cons or the cost of that, I think, is, is in the report and it's in the realm of that $27,000 for the season. Then obviously I tried to think through drafting of that report, that equity equation around what then does that mean for Williamstown and should council wish to consider that also? Yes, thanks Mr Mayor. So, yeah. um, I think I think there is actually, I understand it's in the report, but the resolution does not amend the policy basis. 
So if we want to amend the policy basis, it should be in the recommendation. Okay. Okay. So <coughs> my understanding is because we've got yes, a policy on it, we need to put it in the recommendation to make the policy change. Further question. So I understand the um, uh, the impetus for providing equity, but given the Williamstown pool isn't heated, um, does that change the conversation? Would be my question in terms of, and, and I guess have we had similar feedback from Williamstown pool users around the confusion about whether or not the pool will be open? I can't answer that. Pool's too cold for me. <laughs> Um, look, bear in mind it is a pilot, uh, so I don't know what a pilot means in this case, whether it's for the whole season or if we see that it's not viable, we can come back and make some multiple alterations, I don't know. Is there anyone want to um, Are you not a councillor anymore, are you? Um, Ms. Dav. Thank you. So, Williamstown, um, I've not had direct feedback in relation to the complexity around will it won't be open. I think the current uh, community sentiment around outdoor pools, there probably is a feeling that that should be echoed, um, but that's only with this current, current climate, I guess, in that regard. Um, sorry, the second part. Whether or not the not being heated has any impact. I can't tell you. Well, there's no I think, you know, standard industry practice is that in lower temperatures, outdoor pools remain closed. I am aware last year there was also some lap swimmers that were keen to swim at any temperatures in Williamstown as well. So I think it's probably been consistent at this particular time to do both, in my opinion. Yeah. Now we have to clarify that point. We need a point five, is, and you're happy to know. Okay. Baby brain. I, that's my, my mistake. <laughs> no, no, no. Point, of, point of clarification. Yes, that's right. um, there is a service level decision being made here that is based on a policy position. Yep. The officers recommended an alternative policy position in terms of the service level. But to be really, really clear, I think yep. the council needs to be clear exactly when it wants to open its pools. Yep. That's right. There needs to be a fifth point. I'm just a, still a little bit unclear. Just is that? Does that mean that the we will not have a a temperature just at all? There'll be no temperature. Just based on the temperature, whether it opens or closes. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That's why I understand it. Yeah, that's good, that's yeah. a good idea. Oh, it's you told me you would see. <laughs> <laughs> so is everyone <laughs> move Councillor Weiss for the recommendation as it as it sits? And that's based on the understanding that there is no temperature, the times as in the document are as it stands. And yeah. Councillor Troop, you've seconded. I'll second. <laughs> Are we okay with the policy or are we still at odds? <laughs> we can make it work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, yes. Yes? Well, no. Actually, we'll expect some attendance data. Your pardon? There will be some attendance data come back to the Chamber in relation to this outcome. Absolutely. It is a pilot, so I guess we we'll just will get information with respect to Thank the attendances. Councillor Hearn, did you have a question? No, I was just going to second the motion then. Okay. Will the mover and the seconder wish to speak to the motion? Um, just briefly. I apologise again for the confusion I created. Um, yeah, I, I think it makes sense if we're going to support additional opening hours at Miriam we do the same at Williamstown. Um, I think it's really important that we do continue to monitor visitation numbers and see if this is working. Um, but this is a lot of the feedback that has been coming back is that, you know, the opening hours is one of the issues and that's been affecting attendance um, numbers. So let's see how it goes. Councillor True. Yeah, I just agree with that. I think that we need to put our, all resources into this and just really see where it leads us. And like as a pilot, it's a pilot, so we can evaluate it later. And I'm sure the working group will come back to us with 
you know, feedback from the, the people who are using it. So I think it's worth our while doing. Thank you. All those in favour? Carry. Page 828, 7.3.2.4, the big project, Lindock Recreational Park Design and Costings, 828. Any questions? Councillor Boothby? Um, so it's just a general question. Obviously, the difference in uh, costings from 2019 to 2020 are beyond the stream. Um, are there, you know, some decent reasons for that that are beyond our control? Or, have, you know, I guess my concern is with the big project projects, how far out are we going to be with all of these? If that's the kind of difference that we're going to have, and you know our future forecasting and project funding will just gobsmack that it's that far out. That's all. So if there are extenuating circumstances that are COVID related or access to labour related or something, it'd just be great to know what the big differences were. Mm -hmm. I'll have to take it on notice and deconstruct the whole budget, but well, I don't on that do particular that. budget. But I don't think we can blame it just on COVID. Uh, the reality is they are master plans that, um, until you do design, costing a master plan is a very different beast than costing a design, and scope creep and other those types of activities as well. Um, more than happy to do a, a reconciliation of where the changes are. Yeah, and I'm not through you. Yeah, I'm not looking for a, to create work here. It's just that yeah, you know, it's a stark contrast, and it's just trying to actually understand, you know, exactly. So all the grant applications we've currently got, for example, obviously going if we're going to be asking for a certain amount of money and when we go to the detailed design phase, we find out that we don't have enough to actually do what we're going to do, that's a huge concern, that's all. And as, through you, Mr Mayor, and as we do the grant application processes, we refine those down to get those more accurate. Absolutely. And then where there is scope or bracket movement, we either evaluate that out or come back to the council and have a conversation as to the value of further investment in those particular items. Councillor Havick. I'd like to read the, move the recommendation. Thank you. Second. Councillor Boothby. Do you like to speak to the motion, Councillor? Yes, I attend the uh, meetings down there for the Lindog uh, Recreation Park and the big project. I know that uh, there's been a lot of work being done on it, and I wasn't at the last meeting, but I think you were in there. Yep. And uh, it's come back, and uh, I know that there's, it has been drawn down because of the cost. The meeting hall is not going ahead at this stage; it's going to be put off. So, so that's something to do with cost in itself. So, it looks very good to me, and uh, so forth. So, I totally approve it. Councillor Boothby? No, look, uh, echo your sentiments. Um, <coughs> the last meeting I attended with uh, Ms Tappert, it was very well received. There was, there was clarification and questions from the various stakeholders, and I thought it was well, well um, received by everybody, and they're very grateful that you know, these things are moving forward. So, uh, Perhaps I could thank Ms Tappert for the work she's done as well. Yeah, well the plan done. looks excellent. Thank you. All those in favour? Carry. <coughs> Page 913, 7.5.1.1, the uh, Draft Development Plan Consent Delegation Policy under the De Development Act. Any questions? Council receives and considers and adopts the draft development consent delegation policy at attachment one. The mover moved Councillor Boothby and seconded Councillor Angus. Right to speak? No, thank you. <laughs> All those in favour? Carry. Page 920. <laughs> I'm 
was a recommendation. Moved by Councillor Johnston. Seconded, seconded by Councillor Hearn. Would you like to speak? No. Councillor Hearn? No, no. All those in favour? Carried. Page 9.30, 7.5.2.1, consideration and adoption of committee resolutions, the Barossa Bush Gardeners. 9.30, any questions? So I'd like to move the motion. Councillor Hearn, seconded Councillor Schilling. Wish to speak? No, no, it's all self-explanatory, Mayor. All those in favour? Carried. Page 941 is the Regional Public Health and Wellbeing Plan. 7.5.3.1. Any questions on the Regional Public Health Wellbeing Plan? Not someone like to move. Councillor Angus, seconded Councillor Troop. You wish to speak? All those in favour? Carry. Members, we now come to two confidential items. So I'll ask someone to move. We move that way. Moved Councillor Johnston, seconded Councillor Boothby. All those in favour? Carried.
Thank you. You're out. We have another item to look at the um, in our agenda, the consensus agenda 8.2.1, the process, uh, assessment panel, terms of reference and operating and meeting procedures. Would someone move we go into confidence? Move Councillor Boothby, seconded Councillor Miller. All those in favour? Carry. Now I'm led to believe there is, uh, we have 9.1, uh, urgent other business and there is another item that we'll address but 9.1 <coughs> is on our agenda first. That's a request for leave of absence from uh, Councillor Hearn from the 13th of December 2020 to the 20th of December. 2020, inclusive. Councillor Hearn, are you declaring an interest, sir? Yeah, I'm declaring an interest, me. I wasn't just going out. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to move that recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> well, before oh, I even get out. <laughs> <laughs> it goes for 12 months, doesn't it? Councillor Merritt. <laughs> a request for a leave. Moved. Yes. Second of... That's uh, council, moved Councillor Miller. Second of Councillor... Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, all those in favour? Carried. If we bring Councillor Hearn back to the meeting. With the leave of the meeting, uh, there's an urgent other matter that uh, Councillor Angus has uh, talked to me about. So, Councillor Angus, do you wish to address that matter? Yes, um, I, I feel that if Council makes no comment about the government's decision uh, about, the, about our application for GM free status, we're just taking it lying down. <coughs> I think we should maintain some communication and the uh, CEO has uh, given me a, um, a suggested uh, instruction that I'll read uh, just for a future action in regard to this, and that is the council note the decision of Minister Basham, circulated by the Director of Development and Environment Services, to reject our application for a gen genetically modified free browser council and their right to the minister outlining a disappointment with the decision, the process, and costs and resources incurred by local government. And the council continue to work with adjoining councils and BGWA to address legislative mechanisms to achieve an alternative approach that is not based on council boundaries. Now, if that requires to be moved, I'm happy to move that that is what happens. Thank you. Seconder. 
I'll second that. Please. Second it, Councillor Hearn. Yeah. Ask a question? Yes. Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> I well, if you can speak to your motion now, sir. Yeah, I will. Um, the fact that uh, 11 councils put in an application to be GM free or for GM free status, and um, all 11 were knocked back um, because they couldn't demonstrate, according to the, count, the, the government guidelines of economic detriment, uh, yet they maintain a GM free status on Kangaroo Island because it actually was never included in the equation to start with. Um, why did they put us through the, um, the, the hurdle jumping mechanisms to say, well, you know, you've got to put out the case? 11 councils bothered to do it um, when probably they had no intention of ever declaring uh, any GM free areas on the mainland in the first place. I think. To just accept it after we've spent time and effort mounting a case on behalf of industry, um, I think it's a slap in the face, and we should at least say, well, you know, thanks for nothing. Mm. So, so I should be my, my question is really about the last part of the sentence. So working with adjoining councils and cross grain wine to address legislative mechanisms to achieve an alternate approach that is not based on council boundaries. So are we talking about a completely, so I, I just like I don't understand what we would do in that space because at, at the moment, the minister has the power to make a decision that is definitive. What options are there <coughs> to do any alter that at all? Well, I guess what we're talking about there is the Barossa GI. Sorry, the CI. Three. Mr. Mayor, um, the submission that the Barossa Council made and others made is could only be down council lines because a component of the legislation removed some flexibility the previous the minister had to draw lines that would potentially achieve a win win um, and look at um, not disadvantaging those that want to use or those that are within a viticulture area and have those sort of opportunities explored. That's what that component means, and that is consistent with our application with, to the Minister at the time. Okay. So, Mayor Bruno? Just through the Mayor, uh, just to let you know that uh, I've been in communication with the other councils that had made submissions. Uh, the Adelaide Hills is leading a charge to you know, write to the Minister, and they already have, the uh, Mayor has written. Uh, they're also seeking support for the mayors of at least McLaren Vale, Ongapringa, Adelaide Hills and Barossa to continue fighting the cause. Uh, so we're looking at a joint letter uh, seeking uh, ministers support uh, for at least our three regions to be considered or reconsidered, uh, but equally looking at the entire Mount Lofty ranges. So there is support from the other councils in this, in this space. Mm. Yeah, by accepting this motion, it does give me that <coughs> authorisation of council to sign any other process. I think the the interesting thing that I see is that you know if, if there was a certain threshold or a target, it would have been good to have known all that before everyone started all the or put all their energy and, and resources to it. But, uh, you know, right? I, I reckon a delegation would be better, but anyway, <laughs> let's roll it. <laughs> Yes, <coughs> if I can close the debate. Yes. Uh, do you want a question <laughs> first? <laughs> I am going to speak against the motion. Um, <laughs> not that obvious, but, um, we've obviously discussed this topic at length at council meetings and workshops, and I think I've been consistent in my view that we had to make sure that we demonstrated the trade and our, uh, marketing impacts on our region if we were to seriously pursue this. And whilst a lot of work went into this consultation um, and a lot of consultation with industry groups. I don't believe that we did address that criteria and obviously that's um, the determination the assessment panel has made on that one there. Um, a lot of people have said we haven't been given the time to demonstrate that but we need to be realistic. This GM issue has been around for 20 odd years and if anyone was seriously going to try and capitalise on that, they've had the opportunity to do it. So this is not something you know that's just come up in the last six to 12 months. KI has clearly demonstrated that um, and that's why they have an exemption. Whether you know um, this council believes that's fair or not, that is what it was based on um, and that's always been the understanding. 
I don't agree that it should be based on council boundaries. I think that's absolutely ridiculous, but that was the result of an amendment the opposition put through um, to sort of soften the blow on this one here. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, as the CEO outlined, there were other options prior to that amendment being adopted, but I don't think that at this point we have a case to put forward. If KI has demonstrated it, are we able to find out what they, how they've demonstrated it? Yeah, that, that's we, all we in can the see the document to, to So justify. KI Pure Grain has been marketing okay. yeah. their product as GM free for years. So hmm. yeah, <laughs> we well. as much as you know, there was a lot of time and effort put into our submission. I don't believe that we did adequately demonstrate that anyone in our region was going to be impacted. Um, we didn't. There's a lot of emotion attached to this topic, and of course, if you ask someone, "Do you want GM or not?" the answer is going to be pretty straightforward. But we did not demonstrate those impacts. Um, whether we could or not, that's another argument. But yeah, that's where we're at. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just making true. Just through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just making a comment. Obviously, when we went to consultation, we sort of set up kind of an expectation. I feel in the like in the public arena, they kind of and to we probably need to address the fact that it wasn't particularly our decision. You know that we were influenced by externals, and I think that's probably you know. 99% people will say it's our fault that we didn't receive it, perhaps. So I think it might need to be clarified. So I think I'll support it too. Yeah. Any further comment? Questions? Now, Adam, you want to close the debate, Councillor? Yes, I may. Thank you. In, in the absence of um, Councillor De Vries, I'm going to keep you here for another 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> This wasn't actually a council decision. This was a community and industry decision which we put to the government. And the government has basically said, your industry doesn't have a, an argument. Um, and by the time we get any anything in motion, the planting season will have come around, the horse will have bolted, uh, and it will be too late. I still don't think that's an excuse for saying nothing and doing nothing. But by next April, people will be sowing GM canola around here if it hasn't already been done. Um, but I just think the, the, the government was paying lip service to us. And if they weren't serious, they shouldn't have put us through the, the process. So for what it's worth, uh, I'd ask you to support the motion, please. Thank you. That closes the debate. All those in favour of the motion as put by Councillor Angus, those against, the motion is carried. Thank you, councillors. That's our agenda for the November meeting. And uh, with that, I'll close the council meeting.